an author accused of murdering his popular wife. I would never have done anything to hurt her. I think Michael Peterson is a master at making people see what he wants them to see. Was it an accident or foul play? How do we go from soulmate and lover to cold-blooded murderer? Could the local hero really be a killer? Sitting here today, I have no idea who Michael Peterson is. None whatsoever. A man who had it all. But would he kill to keep it? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. North Carolina, home of the best-selling novelist and newspaper columnist Michael Peterson and his wife Kathleen, a prominent socialite. They were a real couple. It was uh, this kind of relationship that you know everybody would wants or strives for. The Petersons lived in a sprawling 14-room mansion in Forest Hills, Durham's most prestigious neighborhood. They're both so bright. And you put them together, and you've got a whirlwind of intelligence and charisma and excitement and insight. And people just like being around them. Everyone in Durham knew the rich and popular Petersons. Kathleen was a fixture at society events. Michael was a best-selling author and a war veteran. But all that would change in December 2001 when the police received an emergency phone call from the Peterson house. I could hear someone that sounded like they were sobbing. When we got into the house, and you know, as soon as we made our left-hand turn and went just a little bit forward, is when we noticed that that's where the patient was laying, was at the at the foot of the stairs. And Michael was Michael Peterson was standing right there on top of him. I laying there. I mean, blood everywhere on the wall, all of her body. Her eyes was open. You know, I can just. I mean. Just that's, that, that look out in space, like, you know, just looking nowhere. I mean, you see that a hundred times in EMS with the eyes open, you know, the patient is deceased. Distraught, Peterson tells the paramedics that he and Kathleen drank champagne and watched a video before deciding to go to bed. He went out to the pool to turn off the lights while Kathleen went up to the bedroom. When he came back in the house, he found her lying at the bottom of the back staircase. Durham Police Sergeant Terry Wilkins arrives next at the Peterson house. I was immediately struck with the amount of blood that was on the scene, and there was spatters considerable distance up the wall. There was a pool of blood. It was very obvious that there was a need to call someone. Homicide detective Art Holland is paged to the scene. There was just a tremendous amount of blood on her clothing, on the walls, behind her, on the steps, on the uh, face plates of the steps, and on the bottom of her feet. As Holland examines the scene for other clues, police officers escort Michael Peterson to his study at the other end of the house. He did seem somewhat confused. Um, you know, there were some things that I would say as a normal part of my behavior I, I'm not sure that I would be acting that way it was brought to my attention that, that Mr. Peterson was on his computer at, at some point uh, when his wife has just been found deceased he just sent a, a message that that he uh, was not or did not seem to be uh, concerned uh, about losing his wife Holland continued his survey finding blood on the ground 
the couch, and the front door. There was some blood on the inside of the door, which appeared to be smeared or wiped. There was the smell of the alcohol in the sink, why it was poured down the sink, and the placing of the two champagne glasses beside the sink, one being smudged with fingerprints, and the other one, there was just no finger impressions or smudges on it whatsoever. There was just a lot of things that just did not, um, did not, did not add up. But based on the scene, Holland did know one thing. Michael's story just didn't make sense. It's the kind of headline that just takes your breath away. Because it's Forest Hills, because it's Michael Peterson's wife, because it's Kathleen Peterson who has the utmost respect, because it looks suspicious, because it's bloody, he was absolutely distraught. I mean, they really were a very, very close couple. Um, he lost his best friend, his companion, and everything else. He was, uh, he was totally distraught. In the days following Kathleen's death, Michael laid low. But without answers, Kathleen's family was quickly becoming suspicious. When I finally see Michael, he asked me to do the funeral. But he won't talk to me about what happened to Kathleen. He won't talk to my sister Lori about what happened to Kathleen. But he's talking to his brother Bill. And he's talking to a lawyer. He's functioning just fine. Investigators learn that Michael's son, in an apparent effort to explain the fall, is telling people that Kathleen was drunk the night of her death. The neighbors and friends knew that she enjoyed having a good time and she gave parties, she was a, she, she, she liked giving socials. That was played up that, uh, that she had had a lot to drink that night. Holland discovers that at 11 p.m. on the night of her death, Kathleen retrieved an email and called a co-worker from Michael's study. The co-worker confirms that Kathleen sounded neither impaired nor upset when they spoke. Then, the results from Kathleen's blood test come back. More inconsistencies confirmed. Well. It was normal. She wasn't drunk. She wasn't drunk at all. Well, then why is Todd spending all this time telling my sister Lori over how drunk Kathleen was? When the medical examiner releases preliminary findings, Holland learns his instincts were correct. Findings were that, that she did not fall down the steps, that the lacerations were not consistent with a fall. Uh, that is when we changed gears and started focusing on, on what happened in the Peterson house that night. The surprises were just beginning. Once investigators started looking closely at Michael Peterson, they would discover secrets in his past that would shock everyone in Durham who thought they knew him. When writer Michael Peterson's wife, Kathleen, was found dead at the bottom of a staircase in their elegant mansion, all of Durham, North Carolina, was stunned. Michael told police it was an accidental fall, but lead investigator Art Holland had his doubts. Well, th this case is like no other uh, that I have investigated. Uh, it was a very uh, complicated crime scene. Uh, you know, when you're dispatched to a shooting or to, to a stabbing, you know that it was a shooting or a stab. Um, in this particular case, it, you know, it wasn't like that. There were cops and police cars camped out on the lawn for days. Neighbors couldn't believe that the Peterson house had become a crime scene or that their famous neighbor might be mixed up in murder. Everybody was like, they couldn't believe it. This, this didn't, they didn't know that this was Mike. I don't think you'll find a single soul that will ever say that they didn't have a, what appeared to be to me and, and everybody else I know to be about as warm and loving a relationship. They were really soulmates. They were just compatible in every sense of the word. When their paths crossed in 1992, Michael Peterson and Kathleen Hunt Atwater found they had a lot in common. Michael was a military brat born in Tennessee. He came to Durham in the early 60s to attend Duke University. 
There, he edited the newspaper, was president of his fraternity, and a member of Duke's prestigious Red Friar Club. He enlisted in the Marines in 1968, was sent to Vietnam, and returned home in 1971, medically discharged with silver and bronze stars for courage and leadership. After the war, Michael and his first wife moved back and forth between Durham and Germany with their two sons, Todd and Clayton. Using his wartime experiences as writing material, Michael published his first novel, The Immortal Dragon, in 1983. Two years later, a close friend in Germany died unexpectedly, leaving Michael sole custody of her two daughters, Margaret and Martha. By 1991, Michael was separated from his wife, a single father with two sons, two adopted daughters, and a successful career as a novelist. Equally ambitious, Kathleen had also led a successful life. My father wanted his daughters to be very educated, to be very successful in school, to be very uh, career oriented. So Kathleen took that quite seriously, graduated number one out of our high school, and went on to not only go to Duke University, but she also got her master's from there, and she was the first female student in engineering. After graduation, Kathleen married and started a family. Living back in Durham, she started on her fast track to success, climbing the executive ladder at Nortel Networks. She took great pride in her work, she loved working for Nortel. She really enjoyed the people she met there. Kathleen's marriage also ended in divorce, and by the early 90s, she and Michael found themselves living as neighbors and single parents in the beautiful Forest Hills neighborhood near Duke's campus. My mom met Michael through the neighborhood. He pretty much just swept her off her feet. You know, she was ready to be swept, and he was there. He was an interesting person. He was very loquacious and he seemed to be full of stories of life experiences from Vietnam War to travels in Europe and Asia. When Michael and Kathleen moved in together, they created a family, five children total. My mom actually sat me down and said, how would you like Martha Mart to come live with you? And I'm thinking, this is great. A turning point for Mr. Peterson was the money he received from the time of war. That gave him independence. That gave him the ability to live the life of the writer and the novelist that he really had not been able to live before. With his book profits, Michael bought Kathleen the John Buchanan House, a colonial revival built in 1940. The 11,000 square foot mansion was the pride of Forest Hills. It seemed like something out of a movie, and it was. It had been used as the main location for the Robert Duvall Faye Dunaway film, A Handmaid's Tale. There were 14 rooms, each bigger than the next, a giant redwood panel study, an award-winning rose garden, and fountains in the swimming pool. The foyer of the house was so large, and it had a staircase that swept around three walls of the foyer. It was unbelievably grand and beautiful. In 1997, Michael and Kathleen were married in the foyer of their elegant home. Kathleen was really a happy, beautiful bride, and she had magnolia leaves all down the railing, and she had the wedding of her dreams. And I think up on top of that hill in Forest Hills, Mike Peterson was where he thought he belonged. Michael and Kathleen quickly became known within Durham's inner circle for their lavish cocktail parties and grand dinners. My sister thought nothing of having 30 to 60 people for dinner. Her friends saw her as a superwoman, a mother of five, member of the Durham Arts Council, and senior executive at Nortel. This woman could make that house look perfect, could rise to the highest levels of a very competitive company, be a wonderful mother, and be out and about in the arts, and cook, and hold parties. How many people do we know that can do all of that? Michael was just as ambitious. He began writing a column for the Herald Sun newspaper, crusading against local corruption and police bungling. 
anybody in a, a position of power was not a, not a friend of Michael Peterson. He had alienated a lot of people because he's very opinionated and he was very he, attacking the establishment here. Encouraged by his increasing popularity and his reputation as a man of the people, Michael ran for mayor in 1999. What I think we need to do is go back to our center. But his ambition landed him in the center of a scandal. Basically, Mr. Peterson has been walking with a, a limp for some 30 years, and he's been saying that it was a result of a war injury, and it wasn't. It turns out Peterson hadn't injured his leg in combat. It was a decidedly less heroic car accident while on a security detail. And when you're in the political spotlight, lies can be costly. And this one cost Michael the race and his reputation. Some of my mother's closest friends at the time were in support of Michael also. And unfortunately, you know, when that story came out, they really felt like he'd lied to their faces and he'd betrayed them. And that was the first time that I've really seen my mom sh exert, like, her kind of just submission to Michael. She just kind of said, he's my husband, I'm standing by him. It, it, it was a terrible fall from grace, about as tough a fall from grace as you can have. I mean, this was a guy, I think, that was born with tremendous talent. And look what's happened. The defeat in the mayor's race was just the start of a string of losses for Michael. Two years later, he ran for city council and met with another defeat. Then Kathleen's luck started to run out too. Her life, uh, I noticed, started to change, and it was, as a lot of people's lives did, when a lot of the high-tech stocks were starting to go down. She, at times, was worth several million dollars with her stock and stock options the price was drastically falling and the nortel stock and its options was her plans to retire off of she had plans at some point to move to paris and have a second home there the peterson's perfect life was beginning to unravel at work and at home the house always needed a lot of work anything to do in repairs of the house was never a couple hundred dollars it was thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to fix she talked all the time about work and i remember there were times when she would call me crying hysterically and i think that it really was taking a toll on her it was clear that they they were in a significant cash flow conflict um they had hundred and forty three thousand dollars worth of credit card debt which uh, to most folks is an awful lot Clearly, the Petersons were in financial distress. The house, the stock options, the bills. But don't think Michael wasn't aware of what remained. $1.8 million worth of insurance on Kathleen's life. The evidence was mounting that popular novelist Michael Peterson was involved in his wife's death. But many friends continued to believe he was innocent. The people that knew him thought they, they couldn't believe it and they, they supported him and they, they thought it was a, a political, you know, they're, they're going to get him kind of thing. Um, and the people that didn't know him assumed he was guilty. My mother and Mike had an absolutely loving relationship, and there is no way that either of them would ever wish any sort of harm on the other one. At the time, you know, people questioned, well, why, why was I so supportive of him then? But at the time, I had no really other way to think, and who wants to think that their stepfather has done this? My mother would just be absolutely appalled, and this is the last thing that she would have ever, ever wanted to happen to her husband. And then the autopsy report came out, and that, of course, made me completely convinced that she was murdered. Dr. Deborah Radish, a forensic pathologist at the state medical examiner's office, conducted the autopsy. At the end of the autopsy examination, taking into account the number of scalp lacerations, their locations, their orientation, together with the neck injury, the findings were unequivocal that this was not from a fall down the stairs. 
And the fact that she was found at the bottom of the stairs would indicate either that's just a coincidence or she was there for a reason, perhaps to make somebody think that she had fallen down the stairs. The pictures were beyond pale. The one picture in which during the autopsy, you could more closely see the seven lacerations was stunning. That was it. That was the defining moment. This man was not going to beat my sister to death and get away with it. On December 20th, 2001, Michael Peterson was indicted for the murder of his wife, Kathleen. He turned himself in at Durham County Jail and then Flanked by his two sons, two daughters, and brother Bill, Michael spoke publicly for the first time. Kathleen was my life. I whispered her name in my heart a thousand times. She is there, but I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her. I am innocent of these charges, and we will prove it in court. Michael spent nearly a month in prison before a judge allowed him to post bond. He returned home to await his day in court. People, I do know, wonder, how can I go out? But you see, I know I didn't do anything. I'm totally innocent of, of these charges. Remember, Michael Peterson had made a second career as a columnist, and a lot of people thought he was now paying the price for baiting the local establishment. But... Detective Holland was about to uncover a chapter from Michael's past that would send shockwaves through Durham. I received a telephone message at a call of a, a lady by the name of Margaret Blair uh, up in Rhode Island concerning the Peterson case. It was at that time she revealed that she had a sister named Elizabeth Ratliff and that she died in 1985 when she lived in Germany and that Mrs. Ratliff was, was found deceased at the foot of her stairs and that Michael well, was the last person to see Elizabeth alive. The autopsy had determined Elizabeth Ratliff died from a brain hemorrhage and the official cause of death was ruled accidental. After the apparent tragedy, Michael adopted her two daughters. Michael did tell me that Liz Ratliff uh, died not too long after her husband. He told me that she had uh, like a brain tumor. Never did Michael tell me she was found at the bottom of a staircase. This was a huge shock. The Ratliff case, another death, a possible pattern. In April 2003, prosecutors go to Texas to exhume her body. It seemed very odd to us as well that two people that were so close to him could have, could have died in such a similar way. It was a big risk for the prosecution to exhume a body not knowing if there would be any evidence of a, of a murder or a possible murder, and there it was. What we found in this case, again, were multiple scalp lacerations. In fact, there were seven lacerations in this case. The similarities were eerily striking. The autopsy showed that each of the women had actually been murdered. Another woman in Michael's life found dead of the same causes in the same circumstances? Now that's a pretty big coincidence. And even for Michael's friends, it was getting hard to believe in his innocence. But the police were about to learn something about Michael's lifestyle that would be even more damning. Michael Peterson's arrest in the murder of his wife, Kathleen, shook the Durham area. But his connection to a similar stairway death in Germany left friends wondering just who he really was. When I found out that Liz was dead at the bottom of the staircase, this was a huge shock. Now there's two women found dead at the bottom of the staircase? Unbelievable. Michael's two sons, Todd and Clayton, fervently stood by their father from day one. Even his daughters, Margaret and Martha, 
who had now lost two mothers in similar falls, remained by his side. Four children vigilantly supporting Michael Peterson and Kathleen Peterson's only daughter saying, mm -mm, something's wrong here. And then Caitlin broke off and everything changed. I think that that was when I realized that we were just kind of, we were kind of on a separate, a separate mission. I was on a mission really not to convict Michael. That was never my mission. It was really just to get to the bottom of what happened to my mother. The police thought they knew exactly what had happened to Kathleen, that Michael killed her for the insurance money. Ironically, Michael was going to use that money to fight back. He hired a high-powered, high-priced lawyer, David Rudolph. Michael had a long history of uh, challenging authority in Durham. Uh, not just the police, but the power structure, the editors of the paper. Now, do I think that the Durham police were out to get Michael in any sort of conscious way? No, I don't think that. Do I think that their view of the scene and of Michael uh, was influenced by the fact that they had negative feelings about him? They're human beings, and we are all influenced by that. Going up against Rudolph, prosecutors knew they would have only one chance to get it right. What we needed to do was show that this was a homicide and not an accidental fall, and we had to tie Mr. Peterson to it. The prosecution would have to demonstrate that Peterson had a financial motive. They were basically having to live month to month on credit cards. She was on the edge of losing her job. All those things combined, from a financial perspective, we thought caused significant stress in that home. The financial motive was sort of silly. Uh, I mean, you're going to kill your wife because she might lose her job when there was not a shred of evidence that Michael Peterson had ever expressed to anyone that he was concerned about that? As the trial drew near, the state revealed one more card they had up their sleeve. The hard drive of Michael's computer had been analyzed by experts and yielded a surprising hobby. Hundreds of pornographic websites, over 2,000 downloaded photographs, and a bizarre email exchange between a male escort named Brent Wolgamott, AKA Brad, and Michael Peterson. He was a married man, and this is how he was spending his spare time while my sister's at work. You're immediately saying, what kind of marriage did they have? Is, is he gay? Is he bisexual? And could they have had the kind of marriage that's been described if he's bisexual? Absolutely nothing indicated that Michael Peterson was having any kind of relations outside of his marriage. The evidence was he had had an email exchange with a gay escort, and then nothing happens. But the state seemed to have a solid case against Michael Peterson. A damning autopsy report, the mysterious death of Elizabeth Ratliff, and the emails he sent to Brad. But where was the murder weapon? One unanswered question is all a smart defense attorney needs. And so the trial began. Michael Peterson's first-degree murder trial begins on July 1st, 2003, in front of a national audience. Michael was obviously nervous. I mean, anyone in his situation would be. And for Kathleen's family, getting justice is bittersweet. I would sit within a few feet of this man, and the hardest part was looking at his hands and realizing what his hands did to my sister. And there wasn't a damn thing I could do. All the drama and revelations of the past year would come down to one decision. Was it a terrible accident or was it murder? In what is only the beginning of a long showdown, prosecutor Jim Harden and defense attorney David Rudolph present competing versions of the Petersons' marriage. As this case begins to unfold, you will see the grandeur of the Petersons' 10,000 square foot mansion 
you will see the appearance of a storybook marriage. If the prosecution is correct, how do we go from soulmate and lover to cold-blooded murderer? How does that happen? Well, the answer is very simple. You don't. The strongest evidence of Michael's innocence is the call he made to emergency services the night Kathleen died. It was not the kind of call that you would expect to hear from someone who had murdered their wife. Please, get them in here right away. Please. I think somebody sits back in the ambulance no, while I ask you questions. It's a divorce deal, okay? Please, please. Okay, sir. Somebody else is this back in the ambulance. Okay, is she awake now? Hello? Hello? The defense painted a picture of a grieving widower, pointing out that no one had ever actually seen the Petersons fight. But the prosecution countered that for Michael, love was no match for money. So like I said, this is an approximate amount owed on credit card and installment debt and credit line debt close to the time of Kathleen Peterson's death. And the amount is $142,728. The state contends that Michael's way out was through Kathleen's hard-earned benefits and life insurance. First of all, the amount available to Mr. Peterson upon Ms. Peterson's death would have been what? One million eight hundred thirty four thousand one hundred sixty six dollars. Michael's greed, they argue, drove him out of control that night, and the blood on the walls echoed that rage. Well, I observed that again, what appeared to be large quantities of blood uh, all over the floor, all over the victim, her hands, feet, her clothing, the walls. There was blood that was underneath a photograph inside the staircase on the north wall that was, you know, the photograph was up pretty high, and there was, you know, blood stains on that photograph. It just seemed unusual to me. In my opinion, the cause of death in this case was due to blunt force trauma of the head. Were you able to determine, in your opinion, what the manner of her death was? In my opinion, the manner of death in this case is homicide. Blood spatter expert Dwayne Deaver testifies that not only did a beating occur, but someone had tried to cover it up. In other words, something contacted the wall with blood on it, made smears in here, and then uh, another impact occurred, creating another stain which came across the top of that. Then, the chilling connection. Through graphic recreations, Deaver explains that small blood spatter stains on Michael's shorts could only have been made if he were standing over Kathleen as she was beaten. Or the stains on these pants are consistent with impact spatters with the result of a forceful impact and that the individual wearing these pants at the time of that impact was in close proximity to the source of blood when it was impacted. You know, I don't understand how someone can get blood spatter on the inside of their shorts unless the blood is in motion as he stands over her, you know? I mean, it, that was the point at which I could not come up with any other scenario, and that, that was the proof for me that he was the one who actually committed the crime. Next, computer experts tell the jury about the explicit websites and pornographic photos found on Michael's computer. But nothing could prepare courtroom one for the state's next witness. The man Michael Peterson had allegedly solicited for sex now sat before them. What types of sources did you perform? Oh, wow, well, that's, that's pretty broad. Uh, basically, it's a, a companionship uh, for other males of legal age. All right. Um, and did that involve sexual activities? Uh, sometimes it does. Okay, what types of sexual activities, sir? Oh, just about anything under the sun. When Mr. Wogelmeyer says, I'll do anything for money, they're looking at Mr. Peterson. And they're saying, Again, who is this man? But the picture of Michael Peterson is about to get uglier. Friends of Elizabeth Ratliff next tell jurors about her 1985 death. The scene, the body, and cover-up are all hauntingly similar. When I looked at the wall, the blood was up so high. How high was it? I'm almost six feet, and I was standing up with my hand, and the blood was over my hand. 
I couldn't figure out how did somebody get blood that high. Michael was coming and going and handling all the military people. Michael said that she had a brain aneurysm. Lieutenant Michael Peterson said that? Yes. And that she must have fallen down the stairs. In my opinion, the cause of death of Mrs. Ratliff was blunt trauma of the head. What is the manner of death, in your opinion? Homicide. When the state rests, the state of North Carolina would rest its case in chief at this time. All eyes turn to David Rudolph. What this case is about is not Elizabeth Ratliff or Michael Peterson's lifestyle or the columns he wrote. It's about what happened in that stairway in the early morning hours of December 9, 2001. Show me, please show me how this was an accident. I may never like Michael Peterson again, and he may never like me, but I sure as hell didn't want a murder in my family. The defense then uses computer animation to show jurors how a fall might have happened. They contend an impaired Kathleen fell not once, but several times. I can't tell you this is exactly the way it happened, because falls can happen in a million different ways with a million different variations but what i can tell you is that our experts will say that the injuries on kathleen peterson's body not just the lacerations but the bruises all can be explained as consistent with this fall to combat the most convincing evidence of michael peterson's guilt the blood spatter rudolph calls renowned crime scene expert dr henry lee in your opinion, uh, is the bloodstained evidence from the Peterson house and the clothing taken as a whole consistent with a beating death? Uh, no, inconsistent with. The blood spatter goes all different directions. Uh, too much of blood spatter, total amount of blood spatter will estimate close to um, uh, over 10,000 individual blood spatter. Ordinary beating case, you don't have that. I saw Dr. Henry Lee testify at the William Kennedy Smith trial and the O.J. Simpson trial. He can be very colorful, but he turned out to be more colorful than the defense wanted in this case. Based on the expectations of Dr. Henry Lee and the impact of Dr. Henry Lee, huge valley in between. He's spitting out ketchup which many found disrespectful. I mean, he said there's too much blood for it to have been a fall, but yet there's enough for it to be an accident. And after I saw the defense experts, I really knew more in my heart of the strength of his guilt. The one thing prosecutors are missing is a murder weapon. Based on Kathleen's injuries, the state knew the object had to be stiff enough to cause lacerations, but not heavy enough to cause a skull fracture. Kathleen's sister had given her a fireplace blowpoke as a present. That blowpoke was missing from the house. It needed to be something that could be wielded in that stairwell. It also needed to be something that had a configuration that was consistent with two marks that we found at that scene. In the last remaining days of trial, Rudolph surprises the courtroom and unveils the missing blowpoke. Found by defense investigators in Peterson's garage, the item was covered not in blood, but with spider webs and dust. They spent the entire trial proving that it was a blowpoke. We established beyond any reasonable doubt that it wasn't a murder weapon. We brought it into court. I don't think anybody believed that it was just found a few days before the close of their evidence. There were police officers all over that house. They literally measured every inch of it. So had it been there, we would have found it. The jury had seen it all, sex, money, and an alleged murder weapon. But would it be enough to convict Michael Peterson? We, the 12 members of the jury, unanimously find the defendant to be. And we 
talked about the fact that it's the state's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The trial of Michael Peterson for the murder of his wife was coming to a close. After 13 weeks of testimony, it was now up to the jury. They had to decide whether to believe the most important story he ever told or send him to prison for life. In closing arguments, both sides urged the jury to use common sense and make the right decision. You don't decide to kill your wife in a first degree murder for no reason. And the simplest explanation for the kinds of injuries that Kathleen Peterson had and the kinds of injuries that she didn't have is that she fell. To me, the strongest words of the trial were the quiet, soft, yet steely words of Jim Harden, almost whispering to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, these walls are talking. Kathleen Peterson is talking to us through the blood on these walls. She is screaming at us for truth and for justice. Four years of marriage, a beautiful mansion, a blended and brilliant family, a bond that seemed unbreakable had boiled down to 15 hours of deliberation. Kathleen's fate had already been decided. Now, it was Michael's turn. Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict on the issue that was submitted to you? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are returning the following verdict. State of North Carolina versus Michael Ivor Peterson. We, the 12 members of the jury, unanimously find the defendant to be guilty of first degree murder. Just the 10th day of October, 2003. It seems surreal, the guilty verdict, his first lack of reaction, his initial lack of reaction. I'm not sure he was so shocked. I actually saw someone who said to himself, the game's up. Is there anything you want to say before the court imposes judgment? I'd like to say. The defendant is in prison in the North Carolina Department of Corrections for the remainder of his natural life without the benefit of parole. In Germany, officials have reopened the Ratliff case and are actively interviewing witnesses but some questions may never be answered. I felt absolute relief for Kathleen's family because I knew that with this verdict, at least this chapter in this book could be closed. But in terms of exactly what happened on that evening, nobody knows but Kathleen Peterson and Michael Peterson. It's hard to think that she obviously, you know, went through suffering on December 9th, and I'm sure that there was a lot of suffering before then that I sadly probably didn't know about. I think that um, it's really nice to just remember her as such a loving and giving person that really, I don't think she really had any regrets except for she would have loved to live 100 years more, so. Michael Peterson may have been a celebrity at one time, but fellow inmates weren't exactly lining up for autographed copies of his books. In fact, just a few days into his life sentence, he was beaten up in a prison fight. Small consolation for Kathleen's family who were trying to get used to life without her. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.